Especially of an animal in a wild state after escape from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising. Freedom schools, the Maroons, rebellion thriving. We've been rising since the dawn of creation. Sun in the blood of our veins, liberation runs from Muhammad. Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Anjali Nathupadia. We begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing white supremacist, imperialist, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, settler, colonial violence in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option. The only way is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Amidst the show's focus on unapologetic truth-telling, then, please practice excellent self and community care while listening. Welcome. My name is Anjali Nath Upadhyaya. I'm academically trained as a political scientist, a philosopher, and a professor. I've been teaching at the intersection of women's studies and political science at various universities and in community independently for the past 16 years. So to begin to get into it, thank you for listening. Feel free to grab a notebook and pen. If relevant, please don't feed any trolls. And as we begin to get into it, just to share a little bit of context, and especially for folks that might be tuning in for the very first time. So you know that this series is about decolonial discernment. What is decolonial discernment? That's a phrase that I use to teach people how to cut our conceptual losses. Like any little bit of, say, Eurocentric gunk that might be in our head that'll make whatever we create in the world stink. But if we clean that poison out, we're less likely to fuck up our projects than whatever it is that we're creating in the world. Especially if we're trying to have a decent impact in the world with our lives, let alone just not doing more harm than we may have already done, this is incredibly important to consider. But the thing is, colonial mentalities aren't just about race or class. No, colonialism has and is still fucking with essentially all of the things. What does that mean? Colonization might have distorted your ancestral ways of understanding sexuality, gender, borders, age, ability, all of it. It's especially relevant to nation, too. No worries if you don't know exactly what I'm talking about for the moment. We'll get there. So let's keep on with our weed identification and pulling, shall we? This means we need to talk about how gaslighting keeps people confused, complicit, and counter-revolutionary in the face of this deadly matrix that we find ourselves within. So to begin to get into it, what is gaslighting? According to Dr. Stephanie Sarkis in her book, Gaslighting, so of that title from 2015, she asserts that the goal of gaslighting is as follows keeping you off kilter and questioning your reality. So it's often slow and includes insidious manipulation. It can include using manipulation to gain control over others. It can often involve using your words against you, plotting against you, lying to your face, denying your needs, showing excessive displays of power, trying to convince you of, quote, alternative facts, end quote, 
and turning your friends and family against you. This is often to consolidate the power of whomever is doing the gaslighting and to increase your dependence on them. Let's have a look at this definition here. You might see that this, along with other popular definitions of gaslighting, regularly center around one conniving person manipulating people around them. So people engaged in gaslighting will often accuse you of being too sensitive. That's a way to minimize your concerns. And often, minimization is a subset of gaslighting unto itself. You might be familiar with gaslighting as a common tactic of what gets called narcissistic, sociopathic, and psychopathic abuse. This has been a popular buzzword for the past several years. Now, more than ever, there seems to be more mainstream recognition of this technique. However, I'd like for us to try on a different definition of gaslighting here, because you might be noticing that common framework is hyper-individualistic, as in it makes space for one bad apple with malicious motives, but it doesn't make space for systemic lies, which is a typical failing of psychology that we can readily expect. So this kind of mainstream definition of gaslighting also disproportionately focuses on intent. Let's pause to reflect on that for a moment. Have any of you ever heard the phrase impact over intention? So in many sort of social justice and social movement spaces, people will use that phrase impact over intention to remind people of what? What is the common phrase? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. That for those of us that actually care about having beneficial impacts in the world, again, or at minimum, not doing egregious harm, we know that it's insufficient to just say, oh, I had good intentions, right? But if we're committed to making our impact as good as our intentions, then it's actually insufficient to disproportionately focus on intent in this kind of way. So again, like most psychological concepts, it's obscuring the big picture. And you can see here that this mainstream definition also doesn't include a nuanced understanding of power dynamics. They're actually diffuse. They're actually multi-directional. It also doesn't really make space for us to get into enculturation, to be continued about that shortly. Indeed, we could see the colonial education system in a place like the US or Canada, and for sure the corporate media, like we talked about last week, as sites of gaslighting. So if you're concerned about gaslighting, wait until you hear about psychological warfare and wait until we get into our broader socialization and enculturation later in this autumn series. So I want us to use this language of gaslighting as a starting point to teach about psychological operations more broadly, which are actually much more dangerous. Unfortunately, and predictably though, they receive a fraction of the attention within the popular press. Also, the mainstream take on gaslighting is especially flawed in the following way. It presumes some kind of consensus reality that everyone can point to as obviously factually accurate and uncontested. It's kind of like the way that liberals and progressives have especially been lamenting about fake news and so-called alternative facts, quote unquote, particularly for the past four or so years. Now, to be fair, tech bros and social media corporations have definitely substantially harmed our collective capacity for knowing in deadly and horrific ways, particularly within the past several years. And their scale of enabling craven lies to inundate the planet is for sure legitimately unprecedented. 
And we could also talk about the Trump administration's use of the terms fake news and alternative facts. They totally play a role here. But beyond that, most liberal and progressive takes on gaslighting hardly start to scratch the surface of understanding the broader perceptual issues at play. Because they're colonial, cis-heteropatriarchal, white supremacist, speciesist, and otherwise oppressive biases don't allow them to even take seriously the very topic that they're trying to engage when they talk about gaslighting, when they talk about so-called alternative facts, when they talk about so-called fake news. So since I'm trained as a philosopher, you know we're going to go a little bit deeper than that, right? And then those sort of basic psychological assumptions will even allow us to go. And we can do so by actually grounding in an example of gaslighting. So if you're looking at my screen, you can see that I pulled up a visual instance that's unfortunately going to be right all too relevant for many of us actually just within the next week. Um, that of the so-called right holiday, right, a federally recognized holiday being so-called Columbus Day, right, or what many people, of course, celebrate as Indigenous Peoples Day in the settler colonial U.S. It's next Monday. So by now, hopefully most people in the settler colonial U.S. understand that Columbus was a rapist, a white supremacist thief, and gleefully enthusiastic about genocide. Some people might not choose to care about these facts, especially to the extent that they themselves celebrate colonialism or to the extent that they themselves perpetuate rape culture. But do you see what an epic mindfuck this is, right? So this is one colonial holiday, but it doesn't occur within isolation. So in the context of, right, a settler colonial nation state like the U.S., where many people say that they perceive rape to be problematic, right, or many people allegedly would, right, on paper or in public be like, oh yeah, rape culture is problematic, right, like I'm not into thievery, genocide is bad, allegedly they believe that. But then what's up with what's about to be happening on Monday? You see what a mindfuck that is? So the thing is, right, this colonial holiday doesn't take place in isolation, right? Even on that holiday, right, in a settler colony, we also have to pair it with talking about President's Day, Independence Day, Thanksgiving. We can see the same murderous agenda being forced down our throats in those contexts also. And that kind of, right, disgusting lie or brainwashing wouldn't actually be possible without a full-scale indoctrination campaign supporting them. For example, millions of school children are actually taught, right, how does it go? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. They're actually taught a song like this is something that's positive to be teaching young children about, which perpetuates this phenomena that's called Columbusine. So if any of y'all are looking at my screen right now, you can see this definition right on Urban Dictionary um, that says, right, uh, essentially, somebody pretending to discover something, right, and trying to take the first claim, right, or allegedly inventing it, um, when in actuality it already existed, like Turtle Island, right, the continent in question when it comes to this particular instance, uh, and they didn't actually discover anything, right? We could even problematize the language of claiming. I want to stake my claim in this thing. Where does that come from, right? Actually, the history of the gold rush, and not just in the so-called, right, state of California, right, also in the so-called southern United States as well. So even this notion of what being a claim jumper, wanting to stake your claim, I'm going to make my claim here, right? It's totally rooted in this Columbusine phenomena. 
So when somebody says that they allegedly discovered a consonant, for example, and then all these mainstream core curriculum textbooks affirm that kind of lie, what's going on more broadly if we want to talk about and take gaslighting seriously? Like, let's just pause and consider historically. All right, Columbus didn't discover shit. Vikings had already, right, navigated to Turtle Island. Millions of indigenous people already lived on Turtle Island. Pacific Islanders were already wayfinding all over the planet, right? So-called South Asians were already, right, navigating to what would be called present-day Southeast Asia. Actually, historically, Columbus was practically the last person, if we actually want to be factually accurate, to have engaged in this kind of transoceanic voyage. And again, that's easy for me to say as someone that had the incredible experience, right, of being able to live in Oceania for multiple years and to learn about the amazing, right, oceanographic, right, experiences of wayfinding that were especially and are still pronounced in the Hawaiian Renaissance movement, right, but also with Maori and other folks that have been taking very seriously revitalizing their ancestral, right, forms of wayfaring and wayfinding, right, Columbus hardly contributed shit beyond, right, his legacy as a rapist, right, as a thief, as a white supremacist. And yet again, even as much as, and you're hearing me share this, I'm sure folks are like, oh yeah, that's definitely true. How is Columbus Day about to be a federal holiday on Monday? You see what I mean by how a lie that big and that pernicious doesn't usually get framed within this hyper-individualistic language of gaslighting. And that's a problem if people actually want to take seriously gaslighting. So, right, in all of this, right, mainstream U.S. storytelling, that thieving rapist is the one that's credited still with having discovered land. And so this intervention that I'm sharing clearly demonstrates how erroneous that entire mainstream educational framework is that's perpetuated within all of these other spaces also. And yet, when people raise concerns about how these colonial holidays, say, promote rape culture or theft or racism, we're often accused of being, what? Too sensitive. Do you remember earlier how that's a classic technique of gaslighting, right? Accusing victims of being allegedly too sensitive. Look at how that's playing out here. How very predictable. Have you ever heard resistance get delegitimated because someone used the language of so-called sensitivity? Psychological warfare often dampens political dissent in the settler colonial US today and specifically using that kind of language of people being too sensitive and with all of the predictable double standards, right? So privileged people's fragility gets coddled. That doesn't get called sensitivity. But for any of the rest of us that actually care about justice and are actually asserting it, we're allegedly the ones that are being too sensitive. Do you also notice that double standard at play? So for this reason also, gaslighting really merits our attention for community organizers and everyone else who's energizing movements for decolonization and just because it's often a tool of oppression. So I've got actually a little bit of an invitation for reflection for y'all. I'm curious to get a sense, do you ever feel gaslit? And if so, who gaslights you? If so, how are you gaslit? What gaslights you? Have you ever been gaslit, say, by a cis man or a white person? Perhaps trying to bully you or low-key pressure you out of knowing something that you already know? Please feel free to take a second just to pause and to consider this. I could certainly share that my immediate biological family and the corporate media have tried to gaslight me consistently over the course of my life. 
It's almost like that Rage Against the Machine lyric that some of y'all might remember. How does it go? Come and play, come and play, says uh, the billboard, forget about the movement, right? Just this mainstream saturation, whether it's via billboards or other forms of advertising, to forget about our movements for justice, to be able to survive, but instead to focus on consumerism and whatever it is that corporations, right, or political parties are attempting to train our attention towards. It's especially relevant within the so-called information economy, right, or attention economy, where our attention, right, is getting not only specifically monetized by corporations, but to make it plain, it so often is a form of mind control. And if we can see it as such, what does that mean in terms of the psychic self-defense that might be supportive of us not just consistently getting distracted by these corporate talking points and diversionary campaigns. So I could also share, for example, within my own life, I've definitely had, say, exes try to gaslight me, and sometimes it's been to minimize their abusive behavior or their unjust actions. I also feel gaslit by people moving through the world, acting like the status quo is acceptable when we're so obviously those proverbial frogs in a pot of boiling water that's increasingly getting hotter and hotter. I could also share, so furthermore, I've had a whole lot of gaslighting or so-called crazy making exchanges in social movement spaces, in so-called conscious spaces, in self-proclaimed healing spaces. So how about we start to get more clear around how we're gaslit so that then we can do something about it. And for those of you that have been sitting with this invitation for reflection for the past couple of minutes, if anything came to you, feel free to share in the chat. I would be curious to get a sense of what gaslighting has been looking like for y'all within your lives recently. Is there some example that you can think of based off of these questions? Around that, here's one thing that I would want to share, right? As y'all are taking a moment, if you're down to share any examples that have come to you. There's not a moral equivalent, right, in gaslighting across world views, if you ask me. So, for example, someone whose worldview within the mainstream culture isn't a given, if you ask me, can't actually gaslight someone whose perception is the norm within the broader culture. Let's just try on that distinction for a minute. So that kind of claim is problematic in the way that, right, so-called allegations of reverse racism are problematic, right? They're presuming a false equivalence, if you ask me, right? That kind of evenness is non-existent within our reality. And we've got to pay attention to these broader systems structures and institutions if we want to understand what we're actually talking about exactly. So that's why if you ask me, there's no such thing as reverse gaslighting from a so-called alternative to a mainstream or a conventional or a colonial perspective. And why do I bring that up? Because if you ask me, you can't gaslight hegemony. You can't gaslight the mainstream. And why do I bring this up? Again, kind of like I was talking about earlier, because so often when people talk about gaslighting, especially in these mainstream psychological spaces, again, they're unapologetically politically negligent, like psychology in the mainstream always already is and was and has been historically. So we can readily anticipate they're going to be off politically. So even when I listen to right, the folks in the realm of psychology that get the closest to starting to have a clue about anything related to power, right, but again, aren't politicized, so you know they're going to be predictably, right, omitting the most relevant variables in the equation in ways that psychology always has, right? What happens? You know, let's just ground this in a little bit of an example. So say somebody is into the flat earth society, so to speak, and then somebody, right, 
says to them something to the effect of, ooh, actually, I feel like that's been disproven, right? Um, I'm pretty sure that the earth is actually round. And then they're like, oh, no, you're totally making shit up. That's actually not the case. How can we unpack what's going on there, right? This also begs some questions related to cults and related to our mainstream, right, socialization being enculturation, if you ask me. Like, wait, would that be an example of gaslighting, right? If somebody is like, no, I'm pretty sure the earth actually isn't flat. So how are we going to grapple with what you think you know right now, right? In this instance, again, it's a little bit complex and I want to invite us to attend to that nuance because, right, somebody who is making shit up in that way could say that they're being gaslit. So how do we parse out what's happening so that gaslighting isn't just a term that gets flattened, a la these moral equivalences, in a way that I've actually been seeing recently, right? So I could speak to, I forget where it even was, but somewhere on the internet within the past couple of weeks, I think it was like in a social media comment thread, some white supremacist <laughs> who was so deftly using the language of being gaslit in some kind of anti-racist space because there wasn't any kind of grounding in context. So they were like, I mean, I feel like I, as say, a cis white man in the settler colonial US, I'm like totally being oppressed right now. And y'all are just gaslighting me because you're making me question my reality. So I don't know if any of y'all have ever encountered that kind of experience where, again, somebody with, right, unearned power, privilege, authority within the mainstream hegemonic culture is like, oh, no, I'm definitely the oppressed one here. I'm definitely being gaslit. And if you try to say shit about that, you're gaslighting me. What do we do with that? You see how, again, the term gaslighting gets pretty vacuous pretty quickly if we don't have some context to be able to name what's problematic there, right? Uh, and so... Again, I want to invite our serious attention to where any kind of false equivalences might emerge in that kind of way. Because, um, again, that sort of evenness is absolutely non-existent if we're grounded in history, right? It's not real, right? We can historicize, right, the core curricula within the settler colonial U.S. since the settler colonial U.S. has very particular biases baked into it. So when somebody is resisting or calling into question those biases, it's not some neutral, right, realm of people with different opinions. You believe one opinion. I believe one opinion. We all just have different opinions. That's not what's going on at all whatsoever. And if we can't be grounded in history and in context with any kind of nuance, then, right, how are we going to meaningfully move forward in engaging, right, those kinds of situations? I don't know if any of y'all have ever experienced any of that, um, but that's definitely something that I see so often as a substantial impediment to right civic engagement, right, conversations in public and in different spaces, being able to actually move forward and not just get right stuck in the same right nauseatingly frustrating points, right, where people are just playing with words, reveling in abstraction in a way that isn't actually rooted or grounded in history, in politics, in economics, in ecology at all whatsoever, right? Uh, and so, again, you can't gaslight hegemony or the mainstream, if you ask me. That's something, it's astounding to me that people are not talking about that. But, of course, they wouldn't be because psychology is so politically negligent. Um, and, again, so propaganda that's sanctioned by multi-billion dollar advertising campaigns isn't right necessarily solely about gaslighting. So we've got to situate right our understanding of these broader forms of indoctrination in a way that's attuned to power dynamics, to power more broadly. That's relevant here, right? And we're not really going to get any kind of substantial right engagement with that reality, say, in the field of mainstream psychology by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so if your perspective is systemically belittled or marginalized, it's not 
on so-called equal footing with a hegemonic ideology. Not by any stretch of the imagination. Not if your worldview is diminished and if you're more likely to be pathologized, right? If you're more likely to be clinicalized, if you're more likely to be institutionalized for adhering to some of our ancestral traditions or to countercultural practices, that kind of power imbalance is super important to acknowledge. They're not the same in that way at all. So, for example, if somebody is just kind of towing the party line and somebody else has exerted substantial efforts to grow their worldview, those are immensely divergent lived experiences. And we can anticipate, right, in that way that for those of us that choose to say critically think in a rapidly anti-intellectual mainstream culture, it's probably going to yield a little bit of unpopularity, and so on that front, you know, I've actually got um, another invitation for y'all to consider. And if this is something that you're up to engage, um, how about we just sit with this little bit of a thought experiment? So can you maintain your awareness of something if you're the only person in a group of, let's say, 10 that's picking up on whatever that said thing is? So it's kind of like that story of the emperor having no clothes. So say you're in a room, right? There's an emperor right at the front of the room and they're naked. And the other, right, say 10 folks in the room are just kind of acting like that person has clothes on, but you can perceive that that emperor is naked, right? In a moment like that, are you able to respect what you know? I would like to encourage you to pause for a moment and really ask yourself, and for those of y'all who are like, yes, I'm totally capable of doing that, awesome. But for those of you that might not be able to, why not? And I'd be curious to get a sense of what's going on there. I know for some folks that could have something to do with the influence of conformity within their lives, maybe it's about something else entirely. And how about we take this thought experiment a little bit further? So... What if you're the only one in a group of a hundred people who notices something? So again, say it's right, this proverbial context of, right, an emperor at the front of a stage, right, around an audience of a hundred folks, and the emperor has no clothes on, and everybody in the crowd is acting like that person has clothes on, and you're like, uh, that person is definitely not wearing any clothes right now. So in an instance like that, right, a hundred people are acting like the emperor's got clothes on, and you're like, that person is naked. Can you still maintain confidence in your knowing when you're that vastly outnumbered? Please note, you're capable of doing this with the utmost humility, right? It doesn't have to mean that you think that you're chosen or that you're special. You don't have to be arrogant to be like, I'm not sure why these 100 people are acting like that person has clothes on, but with all due humility, I feel like that person is naked right now. So let's not let any of that get in the way of our perception. And you know I'm going to invite us to up the ante one more time here. How about if you're in a group of a thousand people and you're the only one that seems to know a particular thing, right? So now the emperor on stage in front of you that has no clothing on, right, has got a thousand people in the audience acting like everything is fine and you're looking around like, I see that this emperor is naked and everybody else is just smiling and nodding and pretending like that person is not naked, right? Are you capable of respecting what you know in that environment? Please take a moment just to pause and to imagine. Uh, and just a little bit of a heads up around this activity, this sort of exercise is deeply relevant for youth workers, if you ask me. So to support youth, right, in certainly, right, staying connected to their intuition to the extent that they are already, and other forms of knowing more broadly. I'm curious to get a sense of what came to y'all around this little bit of a thought experiment, if you're open to sharing in the chat. And the thing is, as you can imagine, this isn't actually 
hypothetical. Do any of y'all have a sense of, right, a moment in your life where maybe you have actually been that person in a room of, say, 10 folks where something is happening and people seem to not be demonstrating any awareness of whatever is happening, but you're feeling some perception that's not getting reflected within that broader context, or again, extrapolating out, maybe it was a space of a hundred folks and everybody seemed to be demonstrating a lack of awareness of something, but that you were feeling, or maybe that you were sensing Please let us know in the chat if that is something that you've experienced, or maybe you might have been in, right, that third experiment of, right, in a space of a thousand folks, and you seem to be the only one that was demonstrating awareness of a thing, right? So this is in part, right, something I'm sharing as an opportunity to pause and to see if we notice something that's not trending, does that decrease the likelihood that we're going to respect what we know, right? Or if we notice something that seems unpopular, right, does that decrease the likelihood that we're open to respecting what we know? And of course, if we're going to say something about it, we've got discretion there. If we're going to do something about it, we've definitely got discretion there. But at minimum, respecting what we know, right? So we can strategize accordingly. We can engage in our contingency planning accordingly. But at minimum, recognizing, right, ooh, I feel like this building is on fire. And even if I'm not going to shout something immediately, I'm going to prepare myself and my loved ones accordingly based off of what what it is that I'm witnessing now, even if other people don't seem to be perceiving what I'm perceiving, right? So it's a little bit of an invitation to see, right, do we in part get caught up in, right, complicity in gaslighting ourselves? And then also more broadly, how about when it comes to the reality that we've all got different training, right? We all perceive differently. We're coming from different places, right? We've got different education, right? Some of y'all might hear things. Some of y'all might sense things. Some of y'all might feel things. Some of y'all might have, right, built certain skills in your life that allow you to perceive, right? To allow you to sense into, right, certain kinds of discernment that it makes sense that people around you might not, right? So in those cases, especially if you're vast outnumbered, are you open to still having some respect for what you know? So to pause and to, right, just kind of see some of what's coming up in the chat around this. Um, so definitely experiencing this as a younger person when cops and authority figures treated me with hostility compared to my white, blonde, blue-eyed counterparts. Absolutely, right? So in that case, maybe if other people have just so taken for granted, right, the criminalization of BIPOC communities in different societies, they might be like, oh, yeah, this happens. Like, I've seen it in media. This is what, right, I've seen modeled in movies and TV shows. Like, of course, you'd be the one sitting on the corner, or of course, you would be the one that got thrown up against a car. Or you would be the one that got handcuffed, or you'd be the one that gets assaulted, right? For so many people, if that kind of indoctrination is just so normalized, if it's just been so naturalized within their perception of reality, they're not even going to see anything that merits a second glance there. So thank you for that, right, devastating, right, example of, right, a racism that's so normalized, for sure in the settler colonial, say, U.S. and Canadian societies, also so many other parts of the world, too, that, again, a lot of people are like, oh, that's just the way things are. That's just cops doing their job. That's just cops keeping people safe, right? And they might not even be consciously aware of how horrifying the indoctrination is in that moment with an anecdote like that that's getting smuggled into their perception. So I appreciate your bringing in that example, right? It's one of so many that so many of us, right, 
live through on a daily basis, right? Or just seeing, say, kids of color getting fucked with by, right, cops at a BART station, right, or at a metro station, right, or in other spaces of public transit. And so many people are just so comfortable to a certain degree with that being the status quo that they literally like don't even right take a second or a third glance or maybe it's just kind of rubbernecking so to speak like people might do with a car crash on the highway but it's not like they actually stop right it's not like they necessarily right most people don't cop watch or if somebody has a particular kind of vulnerability where they know that it's actually right way more likely to be, right, endangering them to cop watch, right? Most people don't, right, ask somebody else to cop watch. Like, I can't do this right now, but could you please, right, ensure that somebody is intervening that's in a place to be able to intervene, right? So again, these are the kinds of things that for a lot of people are literally just a staple of their, right, transportation as they're commuting to work in the morning, right, or whatever it might be, that don't go acknowledged. And these are the kinds of, right, modes of, I'm going to use some jargon here, it's important, epistemologies of ignorance, right, that have been structurally created, right, by virtue of the indoctrination campaigns that have been the norm in the settler colonial U.S., since the settler colonial U.S., where people are like, that's just what happens on my commute, right? Or I walk by or I move by, say, right, folks who are houseless, and I just assume that that's the way things are without pausing to ask any kind of question like, hang on a minute, does that person want to be houseless? Or if they don't, what on earth is going on there, right? This isn't actually so-called normal or natural. But again, if so many biases are the foundation, right? Gaslighting on top of indoctrination, on top of enculturation, on top of fake news, on top of so-called alternative facts that people's worldviews have been created based off of within the mainstream culture, of course that would be the case, right? Again, this philosophical framework that's called epistemologies of ignorance, right, supports our understanding the way that ignorance is willfully and deliberately created within the mainstream colonial culture. It's not some aberration. It's not anomalous. And for those of us that study the politics of knowledge, it's crystal clear why people are as ignorant as they are in the ways that they're ignorant, right, in particular areas, but not others. So how we can develop the most refined, right, and evolved, right, systems for knowing things that are completely inconsequential, right, within our everyday lives. Think here like spectator sports, right, or other forms of consumerism, right, that so often are a diversion from making sure that all of our community members have, right, clean drinking water, right, or access to shelter, right, or to food security. Um, and yet again, that's just what it means to be normal within the mainstream culture. Um, so how about this idea of, right, feeling like we can be in our truth unless we feel unsafe, right? This is also an incredibly important, right, dynamic to name here, right? So in instances where, right, perhaps something might be going on and we perceive like something is up there, right, but it might actually be legitimately dangerous, say, to say something or to do something or to even notice something, right? This is the kind of, right, differentiation that's super important for us to acknowledge. So what do I mean by that, right? There are options that to a certain degree we've got available to us consciously for, right, navigating what we could call here, for example, dangerous truths, right? The kind of knowing that comes with consequences. And so we're going to talk more later in the season about, right, cognitive dissonance, right? It is this, in part, right, for many people, symptom, if we're going to use this medicalized language, of post-traumatic stress, 
and the thing about cognitive dissonance is, say you're in, right, a gaslighting abusive relationship and, right, you're kind of, right, a little bit torn because there's some complexity or there's some nuance, like, I'm into this person and yet they're also abusing me, right? So cognitive dissonance would be, right, when you're kind of at this interpass of, right, not being able to fully witness the reality of, right, say, an abusive situation situation being laced with, right, a little bit of, right, rewards here and there, so to speak. And so instead of acknowledging, yeah, this is still an abusive situation, it's just laced with rewards, right, or the carrot, right, at the front of the stick that keeps you coming back, it's part of the trap. That's how you get ensnared. Of course, those things could be, right, coexisting in the same unjust or oppressive setting, what cognitive dissonance does, right, in those abusive situations, right, is it's almost like, right, one manifestation of self-gaslighting, where you're like, well, I don't want to acknowledge that this person is abusive or that I'm in an abusive relationship, so instead... I'm just going to continue to maintain, so to speak, as if this isn't actually a horrifically abusive situation. Um, and, you know, I use the example, right, interpersonally here, say, of a romantic relationship, because I know in part that's something that many of y'all might have experienced. I definitely have myself, unfortunately. But then what happens if we, right, extrapolate that out, if we look to see what's this look like on a systems level? And on that front, I actually really appreciate um, the title of Jimmy Dore's book, uh, Your Country's Just Not That Into You, because, right, within, right, a setting of hyper-individualism, so many people are groomed to understand certain phenomena more at an individual level and are not taught how to perceive systemically, structurally, or institutionally, right? To not see, right, the forest for the one tree in front of you, to not even know that there's a forest, right? To not even know that we could be connecting dots because you're just focusing on one dot in front of you, right? To not even know that there's a bigger picture because we're so trained to just navel gaze on ourselves in predictably oppressive ways, right? And for some folks, super privileged ways also. And so I bring that up here because... What's that mean when it comes to just contending with the reality that the settler colonial, right, U.S., right, is this genocidal, white supremacist, right, colonial rape culture, right, that's vi whose, right, very existence, right, is contingent upon, again, genocide, theft, rape, pillaging the transatlantic slave trade. So to be able to, right, heal from post-traumatic stress, we actually need to, right, heal cognitive dissonance. And in a systemic example like that, healing cognitive dissonance would mean naming unflinchingly that reality of the settler colonial U.S. that I just named. But if people are still, right, experiencing, if we're going to continue to play with this medicalized language, because it's much more popular, so I know it's a cultural vocabulary that more of our folks might have access to than, right, some of these other politicized languages that I'm bringing in, right, if you still have active or live, right, symptoms of cognitive dissonance within your life, like, yeah, the U.S. is an omnicide, but I'm stoked that I get Columbus Day off work, so it's all good. Or so then you're kind of minimizing or equivocating, right? And again, minimization is a subset of gaslighting, right? Then that keeps us, right, in a place of not being able to heal, right? Say from post-traumatic stress very specifically, but so many other phenomena also, right? And that's, again, playing with some medicalized language. If you're not feeling it, of course, you can set that down. There are all sorts of other forms of meaning making that we can engage here. Um, but it's incredibly important, if you ask me, that we take that seriously. Um, so I'd like to actually share, if I've got it ready, another little bit of an activity with y'all. Not that one. Let's see if it's this one. Um, so I really want to encourage you to observe gaslighting 
say for one week within your life, if that's something that you're open to. And to even sort of log entries, so to speak, if you can. And then looking back after that week, right, we'll have enough data, so to speak, right, or reflections gathered to then be able to discern patterns. So if an attempt at gaslighting has been directed towards you, how is your sense of self in those moments? Is that something that you're open to considering? Were you clear about who you were? I ask because one major aid in the face of gaslighting is remembering who you are. That way we're less likely to internalize lies. What might be an example of that, right? For, and this is, you know, one of many we could get into just to start to scratch the surface. But say if somebody, right, pays taxes to the settler colonial regime of the U.S., right, and then they're, right, open to receiving shit for that besides the military industrial complex, right? And then you get these conservative talking points that call people so-called parasites, right? Or as having a victim mentality just because you have an expectation that if you pay taxes, you should get something back in the form of, say, health care or infrastructure structure or anything that, right, people with standards might demand, even if they're still operating within a colonial framework, right? In that instance, so you're being gaslit, you're being accused by an abuser of having some victim mentality, when in actuality, you could pause and do, what did I invite here? Right? To see, hang on a minute, who am I? Do I know who I am in this moment? I don't have a victim mentality, right? I have an expansive political imagination. Like, even if I'm going to be paying taxes to a colonial regime, at least give people health care instead of more bombs, right? So you see how it can be supportive in a moment of being confronted with that kind of gaslighting to pause and to ground in who we know we are to the extent that we know who we are, right? And so around this, I sincerely want to encourage y'all to consider, right, that kind of experiment. Why? Also because, right, if we are just being, right, inundated with gaslighting, it actually functions as a form of capping our consciousness, with deadly implications at that. So for example, I've been horrified to see my generation's gullibility in the face of this kind of psychological warfare, especially for people that watch a lot of Hollywood movies and of course aren't consciously aware of the way that they're getting brainwashed by those storylines, especially for people that are into action films. It's like, if you don't even know the way that the Department of Defense, if they're leasing out their equipment, legit gets control over key decisions in the script like no we think that the bad guys should be from i don't know yemen instead of saudi arabia this is a thing right that so many people that are just gullibly consuming propaganda aren't aware of and this of course goes for other generations also not just my own um and not just gullibility in the face of psychological warfare or gaslighting, but also disinformation, misinformation, advertising spin. So you know also later this autumn we're going to talk about how gullible we are to advertising. I really see this invitation to learn discernment at a whole nother level as a form of psychic self-defense, especially in an age of psychological warfare. We're surrounded by psychological warfare. But you know what? We don't actually have to be so easily, right, dominated by mind control or by social engineering. For instance, many of our ancestors, certainly mine included, viewed perceiving with clarity as incredibly important. They were acutely aware of being sensible in that way as an imperative for survival. So on that note, uh, you know, I want to invite us to also take seriously substantial seeds that we could be planting to be able to decrease the likelihood that we keep getting caught up in these kinds of diversionary tactics. 
So in a, an omnicide like the one we're in, where wisdom's not exactly trending, the need for inquiry into the impacts of gaslighting on political awakening becomes all the more important. Let's diminish the impact of this kind of political gaslighting and instead ground in our self-determined perspectives and perceptions. So in the current U.S. political climate, how can we support each other in doing this? Especially for those of us whose cosmologies fall outside of some DSM-centered mode of perception or any other form of Eurocentric capitalist meaning-making. How about we find out by learning about good old-fashioned psychic self-defense in the face of psychological warfare? Tune in on Saturday to learn more about this. And as we're finishing up this video right now, I encourage you to pause for at least a moment, especially instead of immediately continuing to scroll after watching. This is important so that you can have the space to integrate what was shared. You might have heard my words and found some of them sensible. So what does that mean then, right? Within the context of your life for you, if you understood what I shared and want to take it seriously, does anything need to change that you have influence over? So please remember that not everybody is going to understand the journey that you're on right now. Liberalism and other mediocre forms of oppression are super popular. So I invite you to remember what you know. And since we have just a couple of minutes real quick, I'm going to scroll through the chat to see what other ideas have come up. Uh, I've been observing gaslighting for quite a while now. Awesome. I usually confront it and sometimes I just laugh and move on and dismiss the attempts to belittle. Awesome. Um, laughter and humor can be so medicinal on this front and also such a powerful strategy, right, for delegitimating, right, oppressive systems, right, that bank off of them having a presumed sense of legitimacy. So thank you for uplifting, right, the power of humor, right, as a technique to be able to delegitimate systems that never deserved any semblance of legitimacy to begin with. Um, and then that moving on and dismissing any attempt at belittling also is something we're going to get into on Saturday when we talk about psychic self-defense. So thank you for bringing that in also. Let me see what other reflections y'all have brought in. Let's see what we have got here. Um, getting better at maintaining my awareness, awesome. What's challenging is resourcing myself and preparing for the reaction to my sharing, the potential and likely backlash. Absolutely. So a thing around that is, again, for those of us that get a little ahead of these kinds of situations or for those of us that do perceive strategically, um, that kind of backlash is readily anticipatable. Um, and so whatever we can do to acknowledge that, and again, more on this when we talk about planting seeds on Saturday, can be super supportive so that then we're not just constantly reactive, right, or on the defensive so that we have actually got, right, strategies and tools and techniques that we can draw upon so we don't just constantly, right, hemorrhage our energy, right, to folks that might be unapologetically wasting our time. Folks that are like, let me just be the so-called devil's advocate here, like any devil needs an advocate to begin with. And again, if people don't have any systemic awareness, they might think that's cute or that's interesting without recognizing you get that you're literally just being a conformist tool when you do that. Like the corporate media is already the devil's advocate. The court curricula is already the devil's advocate. The devil's advocate is already in all of these hegemonic institutions and systems and structures. It doesn't need you to be a mouthpiece, right? Um, so thank you for bringing that in also. Let's see what else we have here. 
This happens often, raising a personal feeling of unsafety, discomfort, harm, and that person or system making it about their good intention. Sorry your feelings got hurt and their feelings about your criticism. Um, so this is exactly part of why I spoke to earlier what I did related to the focus on impact over intention. This is why even in the one-on-one -on -one work that I do with folks, my sort of tagline is, let's make your impact as good as your intention. So again, for people that care about consequences or care about their impact in the world, that right focus on intent is just woefully inadequate, right? Uh, and yeah, being told that you're being dramatic or wanting attention, right? What patent attempts at deflection? So also something to be on the lookout for. Um, so as we're wrapping up, feel free to share this video. Don't plagiarize my ideas. Kick down some funds if you're able to. And I hope to see you on Saturday. Freedom is out. That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadhyay, and I thank you for listening. I'm also curious to know what this dialogue evoked for you. I invite you to post your reflections and questions in the comments section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to hear on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud or iTunes, where you can find our show archive. If you'd like more information on this show's topic or to donate to the project, check out liberationspring.com. Thanks to Catherine Petru and Nicole Gervasio of our technical production team and Climbing Poetry for our theme song. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud. The power of the people is louder than the evil. Deceitful and coward, people in power. All power to the people is the hour of the peaceful. Freedom.